Hello, I'm Christine Davis, and this is the 805 Focus, where we focus on the people, the places, and the stories that matter to the South Coast. On our show, we like to feature non-profit organizations that are really making a difference in our community. One such group is Domestic Violence Solutions. And with me here to discuss the topic today is Marsha Marco, Vicki Johnson, longtime Santa Barbara prosecutor and strong supporter of Domestic Violence Solutions, and Matthias Bernal, an advocate also from Domestic Violence Solutions. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you, for Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Well, as we said, worthy nonprofit organizations making a difference in our community. That's exactly, that's exactly what you are and what you do. So for those out there who haven't heard of you, tell me what is Domestic Violence Solutions and how did it come about? Well, we literally save the lives of women and children that we serve. And it came about actually in the 70s, Hannah Beth Jackson, who is now our Senator, Hannah Beth Jackson, um, helped write some legislation with um, also with um, Deborah Talmadge and our and Stan Roden, who was our district attorney at the time, and they they wrote the family uh, violence in the family project, and with that they discovered that there was money to help the victims, and so with that uh, uh, the first shelter was born in 1977 in Santa Barbara. We now have five shelters, three emergency shelters, and two long-term shelters. And so we continue to do um, saving lives. We continue to do that. And um, we also help women and children go back into the community and become much more um, sustainable without the violence in their home. Wow, that's fantastic. Well, tell me, how does it work with Domestic Violence Solutions? What sort of work do you do for victims and their families? Well, the it actually starts often with a 911 call. A woman will be beaten or she'll have a gun in her mouth or somebody will be shoving her up against the wall and she becomes afraid of her life for the first time. Or perhaps her child now is watching the father beat her and something happens in her that says this is not okay and she'll call 911. And out of the 911 call, we go out with the police department, they secure the area first, and then our advocates, our amazing advocates who are highly trained to go out on these calls, they go out and what, we, what they do is what we call wraparound services. So they just, if you can imagine their arms wrapping around this woman and her children and saying, you know, if, if you need medical, this is where we'll, we'll help you with that. If you need legal, this is what we'll do. And they're all different services that we connect her with so that she's safe and she has a place to live. And oftentimes she will come back and start in our shelter, our emergency shelter. And at that point as well, we're doing case management work with them. So you work very closely with the police department. Yes, we do. Actually, we do a lot of training for the domestic violence emergency response team and um, we have um, memorandums of understanding with the police department and uh, we work with the district attorney as well. So Vicki, with the district attorney's office, what sort of a relationship do you have with Domestic Violence Solutions? Well, I became involved with Domestic Violence Solutions when I was a domestic violence prosecutor. So I was the attorney in the office that handled a lot of the domestic violence cases. And I used to meet regularly with team members from Domestic Violence Solutions so that we could discuss the various cases that were being prosecuted. We could talk about the victims. We could talk about the kinds of services that uh, DVS, which is our shorthand for Domestic Violence Solutions, the kinds of services DVS was going to be able to offer to the victims. So it was kind of a collaboration and I knew that I could always call on DVS if I had a victim who was in particular distress and needed somebody to come out and really give her, sometimes him, 
that extra support. So I consider them to be a vital part of the prosecution team when I was handling that particular caseload. And then you became more involved. Tell me about that. Well, at some point in time, uh, somebody in my office approached me, somebody who had been on the board of directors for Domestic Violence Solutions, and asked if I would consider uh, being on the board because she was getting ready to step down. So uh, knowing about the organization and knowing what a vital role they played for our office in dealing with our DV victims, I was happy to come aboard and become a part of the organization. And six years later, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> so you're still currently? I, I'm still on the board. I've been the secretary for the last six years. Nobody seems to want to step up and take that role, <laughs> which is fine. Uh, so I've been able to uh, work with this wonderful group of people, and it's just been a blessing. That's wonderful. Now, how does the DA's office know that the work with DVS is working, that these guys are doing their job? Well, it's very clear because uh, victims come to us in great distress, as you can well imagine. I mean, this is probably the worst time in their life. And DVS is the only organization in town that provides these services. So when we need somebody to be housed in a safe environment, this is where we place them. And when we have victims who are ready to leave the abusive situation, which they're not always able or willing to do the first couple of times that abuse happens, we know that we can send them to this organization and that's where they can get the kind of counseling and services that they need. And I've actually been told by police officers who go out on domestic violence calls, these are experienced police officers who've been working in this area for quite some time, and I have been told by these officers that by the time we get the victim into the second stage housing where they can stay for an extended period of time to try and get their feet on the ground and their lives back in order, these officers say that if we can get them into that second stage, into that shelter, they know they are probably not going to have to go back out to that house household again for another call. So we know it is working because we hear it from law enforcement officers who are on the street. And you may not know this, but um, women are not often able or ready to leave the first instance of abuse. So we have situations where officers are responding to the same household again and again and again and again. And so we know that if we can get them into the domestic violence program, domestic violence solutions program, if we can get them into the second stage, we then have the opportunity to break that cycle of violence and keep these women safe and allow them to develop the self-esteem that they need in order to move on with their lives and get out of this violent household. If you were going back so many times to the same house, why isn't the perpetrator being prosecuted? Well, he is. He is. And it depends upon the level of abuse in terms of what happens to him. That's actually a, a, an excellent question. And battery often starts with a small episode. It can often start with just shouting and um, verbal abuse. And then it can escalate. It can escalate to maybe a push or a shove or a kick or a slap. And pretty soon it escalates from there to a punch or to uh, an attempted strangulation. So what we know about domestic violence is that it increases in severity. So the first time that a case might come to our office, it might be just because somebody was shoved. Now obviously that person isn't going to be sent away to state prison. If we prosecute that case at all, it's probably going to be a misdemeanor, they're going to be placed on probation, and they're going to be out on the street again, and then it's the choice of the victim whether or not she is going to continue to live with that perpetrator or have a relationship with that individual. 
And it's often not until it escalates to a much more severe kind of abuse that we can actually get this person off the street and uh, you know, in a penal institution that, where we can keep him for an extended period of time. There's another thing that happens that's very interesting in the cycle of violence. There's a honeymoon period where the woman is, is pretty much drawn back to him because he's promising this will never happen again. And, and then the tension builds and then there's another violation. And, but the honeymoon period tells her, oh, this is the man I married. This is the man I love. Look at, he's so dear. He brought roses. He's sorry. He's feeling bad. I have children. Uh, you know, there's all these different reasons why sh um, they go back. And they go back to some, some, sometimes up to seven times. Wow. Yeah. Now, Matthias, you're an advocate for domestic violence solutions. Tell me what that means. I hear you are out there in the trenches. Yes, well, to be an advocate means that we have to handle the crisis line. That's usually our first um, response to victims. They can call themselves, and a lot of the times the police department will call us to respond to the um, domestic violence emergency response team. That means that we go out whatever time of day or night, and we respond to the houses of the victims once the police department has secured the area for us to engage the victim and start helping them. And what was your inspiration to become an advocate? I think it was learning the theoretical size of what a victim advocacy was, helping the victims get their lives back together. A lot of the times in abusive relationships, they feel lost, they feel like they have no voice, they feel completely like powerless. And my job and what I want to do is help them regain that voice and help them see that they can do it themselves and they can make it forward. And I believe that you were studying criminology and, and had some exposure to some of the real life stories of domestic abuse yes. and, and and that's what led you to domestic violence solutions. Yeah, it was learning about victims that, you know, they felt like they had nowhere to go. They felt like they had to stay there because they had no options. Sometimes they're very isolated from friends, from family, from society as a whole. And they, have n they feel like they have no choice to leave. So in my studying of criminology, I fell in love with victimology, helping victims regain their power and regain control of their own life. It must be very challenging being out there when a call comes in and you don't know what you're going to be facing and then there you are on the spot. Well, well, t tell us one of the most difficult situations that you've been in. I had a call about last week. It was around 4 a.m. where the police department called us and said that the victims requested an advocate. So they give us an address and that's all we know. So we respond, once we get to the house, the officer will tell us a little bit as to what happened. And I remember in this particular um, visit that I made, the victim was pretty beat up, but she was re declining to go to the ER. Oh. And she was declining it because the kids were in the room, so she was afraid that if she had to go, who was gonna take care of her children? And it's a very, very real concern for this woman. So my job then became letting her know that there were options. So going to the ER was an option for her going to a different kind of doctor was another option and that we would also help their children so that they were not separated. This woman in this case was just so afraid that if she went to the emergency room, social services was gonna come and take the kids. So our job as victim advocates is helping them understand that there's a process and that the process involves their kids being safe as well as the victim. Now sometimes the children are also victims maybe they are not being physically abused but psychologically it c they, they can be very very damaged from the situation correct yes T tell me a little bit about that or Marsha I think you've had a lot of experience yes. with the trauma yes. that these children go through yes well there's I feel very strongly that that type of trauma and looking at that looking at violence in your own home over a period of time often those children can become perpetrators themselves because it's what they've been modeled. And, and then these children have very high cortisol levels. And when we do saliva samples on, uh, uh, with them, we know the cortisol levels are very high. And that's a fight or flight mechanism. So they have a very difficult time in school. They're, um, they can't concentrate. They're always looking for you know, something to happen. And it's almost in a, in a very primitive state. 
And so these are the kids that get left behind. They become obese because of this, the cortisol levels. Um, and, it, and they also can um, have diabetes because of that. So the calming of the children is just you know, incredibly important in, in our agency. And you can watch the difference. It's huge when you watch the children at play. And they sometimes are, you know, they're hiding behind mom for weeks and weeks. And then all of a sudden you see them playing and they feel, you know, safe. This is after their time with mm -hmm. you guys. Yes. And, and so in that time, they've been sheltered, mm -hmm. they feel safe, and they've also perhaps received counseling. Yes, yes. And, you know, we're, we're often talking and looking about going upstream and seeing, you know, why does this happen in our society? And why are we teaching our boys to be so violent? And we're looking at these questions all the time. And so with our children that we have, we want to make sure that, that these children are not watching violent videos and they're not watching their father beat their mother any longer. So we feel that these children have, um, you know, they have a way of living now that's different than what they had before. And I feel very strongly that a child that is raised in that becomes a victim also. Even when, when he becomes a perpetrator, I think of him as a victim as well, because this is all he's known. Mm. And it's, you know, it's, you know. Christine, it, to your point that uh, children are victimized by witnessing violence, it's interesting to know, I think, that we have a child abuse statute that allows us to prosecute for emotional abuse directed towards a child. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's not just physical abuse that we can prosecute for, it's also if somebody has caused a child to suffer emotional abuse. So it's not unusual for us in a domestic violence prosecution. If we know that the child has witnessed the abuse or if we get a 911 call where the child is on the phone calling for the police and clearly very upset, we will file an additional charge of child abuse along with the uh, spousal abuse uh, charge that we typically file. Oh, well, I just have to say that the people of Santa Barbara County are very fortunate that that's in place because the children are often the, the biggest victims in these situations. Mm -hmm. I'd agree. You mentioned the 911 calls. Um, a lot of the time, mum is being beaten or in, is in a very bad shape, and uh, the child will make the 911 call. And I believe that you yeah. brought a copy of one of the 911 calls for us mm -hmm. to listen to. And I haven't, I haven't heard this myself. So, just a warning that. Um, it can, some of these calls can be quite disturbing. It, they can be, and it's, you know, there's vicarious trauma that sometimes you will get from these calls, and because they're so sad and they're terrifying. And th these are the kind of calls that our advocates get almost on a daily basis here in Santa Barbara. Okay, Matias, could you play that for I us? play this one.
hard, isn't it? <laughs> now, the children become parentified, and they feel like they have to fix this, you know, and, and it's something that can't be fixed, and, you know, unless they have professional help. It's, it's hard. It's very hard. And these are what our amazing advocates deal with every day. <laughs> you can tell I, I don't deal with it. Um, I would be it would be impossible. But it just, uh, and, and me, um, it just shows that you work with this every day and it still, it still affects you. Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> yeah, these are, you know, these precious children. And, um, and the family, they're all victims too. You know, I mean, even him, how did he get to that place where he's, he would um, brutalize the woman that he had children with? Now, I just don't understand, you know, sometimes. Those calls must be difficult to receive and then those calls to go out on. Um, I, I can't imagine when you've got a little child that is that upset from what is going on around her and trying to find out who was actually injured, who, who, who needs the most care right mm -hmm. then and there. What is the emergent situation? Mm -hmm. Which is the follow-up? What, what, who's emotionally mm -hmm. affected? And what we do as advocates when we respond is we go first to law enforcement, then we go to the victim and say, what do you need? And we let them tell us what they need. If they need housing, then we work in getting them to our shelters. If they need to leave the city right then and there, we try to help them in that process. When they come to our shelter, like Marsha was saying, the kids, a lot of the times they're frightened. You know, they've been living in their home, they had their room, and in their shelter, it's more of a community space for everybody that's there. So we work with them directly, try to get them to understand that, you know, the shelters are for their safety as well as their mom's. And a lot of the times, the kids are very resistant to things like that. And we work with them one-on-one -on -one as well, try to get them to open up to us, at least feel comfortable being where they are. And I, I did want to clear something up yes. because there, the question is always asked when you hear one of these 911 calls, why isn't she asking for information, location information, names of these folks? It sounds like she's just talking, the dispatcher, and she's not taking action. And actually, as soon as that call comes in, they have, the dispatcher has that address. And so while she's talking to this child, she is simultaneously dispatching the police to that location. So when you're hearing one of these calls, you, you, you can't think that nothing's happening. A lot is happening. She's trying to keep that caller on the line to maintain contact and hopefully maintain some kind of um, feeling of at least a little bit of safety that this little child has somebody on the other end that they can reach out to. But she is getting the police out there while she's engaging in this conversation. Mm -hmm. And our police respond very, very quickly, very I'm, quickly. Yes, I'm yeah. sure they're also trying to determine whether uh, an ambulance is needing to exactly. be sent, et cetera. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, one question that I hear a lot of the time is seeing things are so bad. If, if this woman is being so badly affected, so badly abused, why doesn't she just leave? Mm -hmm. And you hear that question, um, Matthias, you look like you'd like to, to I, answer. I hear that question all the time yeah. from both law enforcement, from people in the community, and I think the answer is she can't because that's not even an option. Mm -hmm. Leaving is not an option for some of these women. That's their home, that's their husband, boyfriend, that's the father of their kids. And a lot of the times they try to sacrifice themselves to keep a family together. And that I think is the, the reason why sometimes they don't leave. It's because they can't. They don't know that they have that power to leave. Right. And the other thing that these women know is that when they leave, that's actually the most dangerous time. And statistically, that's been borne out. Often when you hear about domestic violence homicides, it's after the people have actually split up. And so you have this man who is battering you, abusing you, terrifying you, terrifying your children. And what he is saying to you often is, if you leave me, I will kill you. And she has every reason to believe that he absolutely means what he says. If you remember in the O.J. Simpson case, it was after Nicole left O.J. that she was killed. 
So it's a very dangerous thing to do sometimes for the victim to leave, and she, on some level, understands that. Masha, there's another reason why the woman just doesn't leave. Tell me, tell me just very briefly about well, that. Well, the woman becomes homeless, and she, you know, her identity is, is lost, and she doesn't know what her choices are, as Matthias said. We like to also ask another question. We like to ask, you know, instead of why doesn't she just leave, why is he doing that? And I think we need to shift the question, mm -hmm. shift the question back to him. This is a man's issue. Men are violent towards women. And yes, it happens that women can be violent towards men, but the percentage is so low that we have to ask ourselves, why is this happening? This is a man's issue. Men have to step up to the plate and say, enough, enough is enough. We need to start respecting women. And that's clearly why your organization works with treatment, uh, shelter, and also working towards prevention. Yes. You're doing some amazing work, and I'm sure there's people out there that want to help in different ways. Um, if the community wants to learn more about the organization or help, how can they do it? What's the website? Yes, please come to our website. It's www.dvsolutions.org. And, we, and there are on, on the website, they will find all the crisis numbers, and um, if they need help, they can call a crisis number, and, and or they can call the, um, the office and talk to one of us. Thank you to all of you for joining us today. It's been enlightening, and I think there's a lot of people out there that, that weren't aware of what exactly domestic violence is and, and how widespread it is and how it can affect even the youngest members of the family. So you've got the website there for Domestic Violence Solutions. And of course, if you'd like to know more information about our show, our website is tvsb.tv. Thank you for joining us. This is the 805 Focus. I'm Christine Davis, and I hope you can join us next time.